Leia Healthcare. It's good to live. Proud sponsor of the Real Health Podcast with Carl Henry. Hello and welcome to the Real Health Podcast with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, I hope all is well. On this week's episode, I am absolutely delighted and excited to be joined on the phone by the UK's fitness chef, Graeme Thomason. Through his very popular and accessible infographics on Instagram, Graeme has been built up over half a million followers who are looking for accessible, no-nonsense advice around food and weight loss. He has an amazing new book out called The Fitness Chef, Eat What You Like and Lose Weight for Life, the possibly the best title of a fitness book ever. Uh, and he joins me today on The Real Help Podcast. Graeme, you're very welcome to the show. How's it going? Um, good, thanks. How are you doing? All is well. Your book is flying off the shelves. It's uh, and it's up in the Amazon charts as well. It's going really well. It is, yeah. It, it actually got published on Boxing Day, so I was a little bit apprehensive as to how many people would would order it, given they'd still be stuffing them stuffing their faces with turkey. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's going quite well, and it's been a, a month now, and it's still still going well. The publishers are really happy. So um, yeah, I think a lot of people have sent in messages saying that. They love it and it's helping them. So that's the main thing. Yeah, I follow you on Instagram. That's where I came across you. And even over the last couple of weeks, I've seen people posting up in your stories, like loads and loads every single day, which is great. Um, tell us a little bit about you, I suppose, first of all, and our listeners, about your background, um, when you started posting the and the infographics in particular, and I suppose why you started post, posting them. Yeah, so I've been a qualified personal trainer since about 2014. Um and just being a, a generic personal trainer, really, obviously giving out nutrition advice to my clients. And I had an Instagram page, but I wasn't really, you know, I was posting the odd recipe here and there. I didn't really have a, a clear plan. And the more and more time I spent on Instagram and Facebook, I kind of looked at all the misinformation and the the, the stuff that people were posting without any sort of context. And it started to annoy me. So I started posting my own uh graphics and it was just really basic simple stuff but it's stuff that people need to hear um and i started doing that in march 2018 so it's been nearly a couple of years of doing it and uh obviously built quite a lot of followers <laughs> in the process um and it's been quite exciting and obviously led to really exciting things like this book um, and your advice so, yeah. is very much kind of centered around real advice, I suppose, similar to my own kind of yeah. platforms, I would be very, very similar. Avoiding the fads, avoiding the ridiculous diets, the nutrient elimination, you know, that's very much what you what, what you, you talk about and what you discuss with people. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, it doesn't just stretch to social media, it actually infiltrates into the literature that's published as well. So you can see a lot of diet books out there, which you know, call people to have this rigid meal plan that they've prescribed because it's going to help them lose weight, for example. But my book's totally different because, or my page as well is totally different because all I'm wanting to do with each post is just empower people with the evidence-based information that's going to help them make informed choices themselves. And I think that's more powerful than relying on someone's specific method for success i think if people can learn how to do it on their own based on some really simple information it's much more powerful and you know what are the, the key cornerstones for you for healthy eating as a, as a as a pt as someone who's educating the public what kind of key pillars or cornerstones do you build everything on uh for me it's it's understanding the the very basics so when you say healthy eating there it's you know, that could mean one thing for one person, something completely different for another. It's understanding that, yes, the nutrients that we consume is, is very important for our functional health and, you know, healthy foods like fruits and vegetables. We should be eating lots of those. But it's also understanding the other side of the equation, which is you know, how much are you exercising? How many calories are you consuming regardless of the food? Because that's going to determine your your body weight. So it's it's the very basics to start with is just get someone to understand that those two things represent different aspects of health, but they're both equally as important because a lot of people think that if they just shove a bunch of quinoa, kale, smoothies and uh, beetroot down their throat, that they're just going to automatically lose weight. But actually, you need to understand energy balance. You need to understand you know, the basics, um, consuming a lot of protein as well to keep you full, for example. Um, just the, the very basics. 
I think some of the most impressive stuff yeah. from the things that you post is exactly it's the calorie content of the supposed healthy foods versus other foods. <laughs> Uh, and the likes of the quinoa and, and and all of those kind of you know very trendy, funky, supposedly healthy stuff it can be really high in calories. Uh, they can, and uh, the point of it is exactly what you just said there. That you know, if, <laughs> if you consume the most famous one I've ever done is the avocado toast versus Nutella toast, and <laughs> the proportions that I put on each just so happened that on this occasion the Nutella toast was fewer in calories than the avocado toast, but what happened was people just lost their minds <laughs> and, you know, started slating the Nutella saying that it's, you know, sugar is evil and all this kind of stuff, just totally bypassing the very basic message that I was saying is, you know, if you consume this avocado toast, which is more calories, it's going to have more of an impact on your composition than this Nutella toast, period. Regardless of feeling full or anything like that, forget about all that right now. We're stripping it right back to the basics. And this is it. And <laughs> people just lost their minds. But uh, it's quite funny. So I suppose educating the population around that the 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 calorific components of calories in versus calories out is is one of your is one of your key missions, I suppose. It is. It's because I mean, it's people seem to think that you know calorie counting doesn't work for me, or calorie counting does work for me. It's it's kind of irrelevant. It's the the calories in versus calories out. It, you know. There, there's a plethora of evidence everywhere that suggests that that is the thing that will determine your your body weight. And we've got doctors out there who are, you know, proclaiming that it's not the case and that it's to do with your insulin and all this kind of stuff. And it's just confusing a lot of people. Um, and yet there's no real evidence to back that up. So, yeah, a lot of my core messages are, are based around that. And um, you know, from people following you, from people reading the book, it, a lot of it is giving them the, the the education, and then it's pushing it back into the person with personal responsibility for making the choice, be it healthy or un- unhealthy. Once they have the education, the responsibility very much lies with each and every person. That's the thing, and that's yeah, exactly. And I'm glad that you kind of picked that up because with a lot of people out there, a lot of um, influencers, they're kind of inflicting information on people saying you must do this or it's extreme. But, but with me, I, I always try and make my point as unbiased as possible, um, as objective as possible. And the captions that I make use of in my posts, I'm always kind of explaining, trying to explain both sides of the story, but ultimately giving people the information there and without sounding too preachy, it might help them. It might, kind of they'll be more likely to take it on board than if the advice is you know, shouting at them <laughs> so basically just trying to provide people with a calm narrative and some information that they can look at and go hmm, actually yeah i've been doing this for a while and it hasn't been working so maybe maybe this is maybe this i'll give this a go and it might you mentioned influencers there let's just touch on that yeah. for a minute what tips would you give people in terms of navigating instagram it's the main platform where it happens and ensuring they're following the right kind of people the right kind of pages um because there are a lot of influencers out there who are posting you know they're paid posts or sponsored posts or edited photographs or posed photographs there's a lot of nonsense out there you and through your own you very much cut through that do you have any tips for people in terms of deciding who they should follow and who they shouldn't follow on on social platforms yeah, so it, it's not for me to say, you know, for who, who to follow and who not to follow. You know, if I disagree with someone, someone else might not. They might get something from that page. But I would say that any influencer who isn't necessarily a professional in the health and fitness industry, um, for example, <laughs> a reality TV quote star um, <laughs> who <laughs> who does some sort of sponsored posts and they've mostly been centered around appetite suppressants or meal replacement shakes or uh, appetite suppressant lollipops in the last couple of years um and as we know i don't think there's one person that could prove the efficacy of these products and uh, you know for, for people's overall health and and mental health as well So I think people just have to have a look. Um, If it's a sponsored post, it's obviously that influencer is getting paid. And we had the classic um, Lauren Goodyear thing a couple (laughs) of months ago where she, you know, was caught um, by a reporter, which was absolutely hilarious, 
kind of admitting that she never took any of the products that she was promoting and she was almost laughing it off. Bear in mind that her following, I think, is in the mill. I'm not sure, but it's either several hundred thousand or millions. And a lot of them will be impressionable young women who look up to her um, as a role model and will copy her. And so she was receiving money for doing something that she said she was doing when she wasn't. And not only that, she's kind of mocking it. So she's basically mocking all the all the followers that that took her advice and probably um, didn't succeed with with that advice from the product. So I know I've gone on a bit of a rant there, but I would say that those kind of accounts are the accounts that you know you can follow them for for other things, but for nutrition advice, I would I'd probably just steer, steer clear. Okay. Folks, uh, you're listening to the Real Health Podcast in association with Lay Healthcare with me, Carl Henry. I'm delighted to be joined by the fitness chef on today's episode, a guy who I've followed for a long, long time on Instagram. And I think he's someone we all need to learn from and keep learning from. Um, Graham, what are the biggest mistakes people make then in relation to weight loss? So this is where I get to pick your brains for our listeners and ask, and I'm picking your expertise. But we see it all the time. People are always trying to lose weight. And particularly around right now, after the January quick fix, they've fallen off the wagon because they've made lots of mistakes. What are the biggest mistakes people make and how can they get around them? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a million dollar question, isn't it? I guess the, the big mistake in simple terms is choosing a method that they can't sustain. So the reason they can't sustain it is because they don't enjoy it or it's just a little bit too difficult. And it could be a fad diet, which is an extreme change of the behaviours that they've um, had for for the months or years before and it just becomes too difficult um, and I think that's probably the, the number one thing people just looking for the the quick fix rather than being patient and thinking logically yeah because I suppose real weight yeah. loss takes time it takes you know it, yeah, it, 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 it takes you know one pound a week over the course of you know, 16 20 weeks is you know nearly as 20 pounds as opposed to the instant quick fix and the gimmick that people are have kind of advertised to them um, all, yeah. all all year round now at this stage it is and when you consider the time it takes for weight to to be acquired and weight to go on it doesn't happen in three or four weeks it happens over months and years really in, in most cases um so when you consider that it's just ridiculous to think that the opposite is going to happen when you try and lose weight but it's just the kind of it's just people want the quick thing you know your phone can do everything these days you can order food within you know 10 seconds and it'll be delivered in 20 minutes you don't have to move it's just the kind of mindset that we're in now it's uh people would if you give someone the option for example on my fitness pal i think they give you the option to lose one pound a week two pounds three pounds four pounds everybody's going to choose four pounds <laughs> <laughs> and of course what that does is it'll give you a calculation and your calorie target will be very low so that that weight loss still happens. And I think some people might adhere to it, but a lot of people just think, Jesus, I'm really hungry today or I haven't eaten this chocolate in a while because I've been on this diet and they'll, they'll go and binge on it. And uh, yeah, I think that's the probably the number one cause is people just trying to be too impatient. Okay, take me through... Um... I suppose breakfast, lunch, and dinner in terms of the kind of yeah. foods that you would recommend and the foods that are, I suppose that are in the book and the recommendations that you want, might do with your clients. You know what? You know what are we looking at in terms of breakfast, lunch, and dinners? So the first thing about these meals is that it doesn't have you know you don't have to eat breakfast if you don't want to. You know, people, there's always been that those two camps that you have to eat breakfast mm -hmm. if you want to lose weight, or you know, like the intermittent fasting camps of, of not eating it. Just do what you want. <laughs> at the end of the day, um, everybody's different. For some people, not eating breakfast will mean that it'll get to 10 a.m. at work and they'll go and raid the vending machine because they can hardly stand because they're dizzy. For other people, it'll be absolutely fine, and that could actually be a very, very easy way of implementing a. A calorie deficit just excluding breakfast anyway um for those who are wanting to to kind of feel full for a while at breakfast you'd obviously try to include as much protein in there as possible so things like eggs things like protein with added whey powder um even things like you know zero percent fat greek yogurt with whey protein added with some berries um or fruit 
all these kind of options are are on the table but if you wanted to eat like a, a korma for breakfast you know you can do that if you want as well <laughs> um but in terms of lunch i would recommend that a lot of people are obviously busy and you only get an hour um if you're leaving it to the hands of going to the shops every day to pick something up, the options are often limited, aren't they, for for someone who wants to consume something that's quite balanced. Um, so preparing something at home, getting into a habit of maybe cooking something the night before and having leftovers for the next day, and you know exactly what you're eating. Um, you're not going to turn up to the shops at lunchtime and panic and think, oh, Jesus, what am I going to have today that's going to fit my calorie target or my protein target? Um, and regards to to evening meals i think it's just having variety perhaps bulk cooking things and freezing it so that you only have to do is defrost it saves uh, the time a lot of people have uh, families as well so it's it's you know, the last thing you want to do is to cook different meals for different people um but in terms of the actual foods i think to try and incorporate every single food that you enjoy but to understand what's in it and the portion size required for you to still succeed is the key. Um, so it's not a case of completely banning chocolate or pizzas. It's finding a way to implement it so that you can still enjoy it within the realms of your, your calorie target. And you mentioned portion sizes there. I think that's often one of the, yeah. the, 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 the things people forget about uh, when it comes to health. Uh, sure, you know, it used to be when you go to the, the United States, it was like, oh my God, their portions are huge. Now that is very much a global, uh, a global thing. I'm not sure it's just it, it's just you know the USA anymore. I think it's Ireland. And I think it's the UK, Scotland. I think you know it's it's all over the world now. Proportions have become huge. They have, and uh, it's almost like a. I don't know how it's quite happened, but you're right. It kind of started in America, but it's it's kind of just become common practice, hasn't it? Just not only the huge portion sizes, but if someone's ordering a takeaway or going out for food it's just to go and order a massive amount of food you look at the size of the pizzas these days are absolutely huge you know 18 20 inch pizzas and some of them are like two and a half three thousand calories it's more than um or that could be like two days intake for some people um and i think that that is certainly a problem i think the accessibility to these high calorie hyper palatable foods um, is part of a problem because if you consider the process that takes place you're sitting at home thinking <clears throat> i'm going to order a takeaway tonight you go on an app you select what you want you're starving so you probably select quite a lot and it's going to be delivered in 30 minutes you don't even have to move so in the past when you went to get a takeaway at least you would walk or walk to your car and drive and move a little bit to get there. now you're not even doing that so it just perpetuates this thing of not moving enough and eating a lot more calories than we need. Um, but that said, a takeaway now and again, you know, if that's what someone enjoys, they should absolutely have it, but just be mindful. Yeah, okay. And do you, in terms of portion sizes, I suppose speed of eating, have you got tips and tools that we could give to our listeners of how to maybe control their portion size or to to just be a little bit more aware of what they're eating and the speed that they're eating? One of the, the, the easiest things for people to do is to get a basic set of scales. And it's not, not a case of being obsessive and weighing every single thing to the gram, but just understanding how many calories is, for example, you know, the, the, a calorie dense food like nuts. You know, if you were to have 50 grams or 100 grams, you know, weighing it out might actually make you think, oh, hang on a minute. Jesus, that's maybe 600 calories I'm eating with a snack here. Whereas if you weighed it out and saw, you would maybe reduce that to 30 grams and all of a sudden you're you're making a, a saving there. Um, and it just kind of informs you a little bit more and you start becoming a little bit more skilled um, about eyeballing food because calorie counting, calorie counting is not a prison sentence. I view it more for people as a temporary education um, whereby they can kind of learn what portion sizes look like per weight and per calorie. And then eventually that just becomes second nature and you just eyeball portion sizes and you don't have to count anymore. One of the great things about your Instagram page and now getting to chat to you is the simplicity of what you're trying to do, which is it's an educational component of learn what's in things, educate yourself and make better decisions because of that, you know, because you know that little bit more about it. Um, 
out of interest, calories on menus, are you for or against? Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's very question. topical here in Ireland. It is yeah. one of the hot topics at the minute. There is um, a suggestion from government that maybe we should have calories on menus. There's a huge lobby against it. So uh, just out of interest, what's, what's your take on it? To be honest, if I if I had to select one or the other and it had to be black or white, I'd go for calories to be on the menus mm -hmm. because the, but the, the one thing that makes me wary about saying it is obviously you'll have people that will become a little bit obsessive about that, you yeah. know. Um, however, when we have a obesity epidemic like we do and people not realizing how much calories that they're how many calories that they're eating, it can surely only be a good thing for that but in terms of someone's mental health i can understand why there's maybe reservations for it and just the basic principle of you go out to enjoy yourself why does there need to be calories on a, on a menu um i'm sure there's a way that they can do it where it's not you know if someone wants to know the calories mm -hmm. they can maybe turn to the to maybe a different menu or something <laughs> would you like the calorie menu or the non-calorie menu something like that um so that people that want to know the information can get it and people that, that don't, don't have to look at it. Okay. For a final question. Um, your top three tips, I was going to say top three takeaways. That's potentially the wrong word for this conversation. Your, your top three tips for our listeners to take away to improve their health. What are your top three? That's a horrible question because uh, I'm sure you have loads, but I'm going to ask you for your, for your top three. Um, so I would say by health, do you mean overall health or do you mean weight loss specifically or yeah let's uh, um overall health yeah with overall health i think the number one thing is the mental health to be honest i think if you're in a good positive place with that the rest of your decisions that are, are going to result in the 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 your other aspects of your health like your nutrition are going to be a lot better so if you're not in a very good headspace um the rest isn't going to follow so i think taking care of that and nurturing that is is number one um number two i think is just understanding what you're trying to get out of whatever goal that you have because a lot of people do make changes to their health because they see others do it or they see their influence favorite influencer do something crazy and they think they have to do it as well but just to be a little bit more informed and actually want to make um a change and also I guess it's just to be flexible. So, for example, if we're talking about the weight loss aspect of this, it's, you know, it, it, if somebody had a calorie target, maybe look at the it weekly instead of daily, you know, so that if you go over your calories because you went out on a night out or a social occasion, you can then adjust calories the subsequent day days um, to make up for that so that you're always able to, to be flexible um the last thing you want is to feel like you failed because you went out and went you know a thousand calories over or something like that okay as ever really good tips really important and yeah. really beneficial which is great if people want to find out more about you where can they find you on social media so they can find me on instagram which is the fitness chef with an underscore after it because someone already took that name when i <laughs> signed up um and facebook and Twitter is just the Fitness Chef, and the website is fitnesschef.uk. Fantastic. And of course, your new book is out in all bookstores and on Amazon as well, and people can check it out whenever, yeah. whenever, they, whenever they can. Graham, thank you yeah. so, so much for joining us on the show. I followed you for a long time. I'm delighted to get to chat to you and to bring your message to all of our listeners uh, around the country here as well. So thank you so much for joining us, and the very best of luck with the book. Folks, that's it for another episode of the Real Health Podcast in association with Leia Healthcare. Thank you so much for listening to today's show. I really hope you enjoyed it. It's the first international show that we have done, and something we're going to do more and more over the course of this year taking the podcast around the world, finding even more experts to deliver health tips and tools for you. Have a wonderful week. Use those tips, improve your health, and we'll see you next week. So long ago. Leia Healthcare. It's good to live. Proud sponsor of The Real Health Podcast with Carl Henry.